Good morning. I need a little bit more volume, madam. <laughs> Good morning, Oakdale. We're, uh, I was enjoying some of the good fellowship too, so uh, we're starting a few minutes late, but let's, uh, let's get going for class. Come on in and find your seat. Have a good time. Uh, good, good crowd this morning. So a lot of people here. If you see somebody you don't recognize, please introduce yourself. This year we are reading through the Bible, uh, and as we, as we are reading through, we're uh, covering lots of information. We're asking you to uh, journal, uh, so there are some, some journals if you're uh, running out of space or if you are just starting, uh, but we want you to ask as you read this through this to uh, answer the question, what is important to God, and what are you seeing that is important to God? There's a few up here, and there are other readings for the month of January on the green sheets in the foyer, or in your weekly email bulletin, there is uh, a link for actually the entire year's worth of readings. So hopefully you'll be able to, to access one of those. Uh, and as I said last week, uh, in this class, I would like to serve more as a moderator, and certainly not a lecturer. Uh, to, uh, to discuss and to let you talk and see what it is that you found. Um, and we'll explore some of those things. If you don't have anything that you want to talk about, I do have some things that I will ask questions about and we'll talk. Uh, last week, I found this interesting to me, and as some of you have mentioned you did too, that as we look at where this is happening in, in ancient Israel, that it is actually much smaller than the state of Oklahoma. Uh, that for all intents and purposes, uh, the, the Sea of Galilee, to the, from the top of the Sea of Galilee to the south of the Dead Sea, is the length of I-35. Uh, I think I made some rude comment about Lawton and Altus being the uh, Philistines. <laughs> That's all right. We're going to talk about the people around Tishomingo being the Moabites today. So, um, but I, I thought this I thought this was was interesting. So this last week, uh, our readings were basically out of First Samuel chapters twenty through thirty one, the end of First Samuel, with uh, Saul chasing David and he's trying to kill David. I think I said conflicts between Saul and David. It's really not conflicts between Saul and David. David's fine with Saul. Saul doesn't like David. Uh, at the end of 1 Samuel, Saul and three of his sons die in battle, and there's all kinds of stories through there. And then the first uh, part of 2 Samuel, the first four chapters, David becomes the king of Judah. Uh, Ishbosheth, the remaining son of Saul, becomes king of Israel. Uh, and connected with that are the, uh, the Psalms that David wrote during this time period. Let me throw up one more graphic for you as you're thinking about what, what you want to bring up. That this I found is all of these wanderings of David uh, when he was fleeing from Saul. You see from, uh, from Gibeah up to Ramah to Nob over to Ekron and Gath and the Philistines and back through the wildernesses is not that big of an area. In fact... If you wanted to equate that to the state of Oklahoma, you'd be basically looking at South Oklahoma City to Chickasha to Paul's Valley, except for that little trip over there to, to Moab where he took his parents to have asylum with the king of Moab, and that's that little trip down to Tishomingo. So it's not a huge part of the world. But as we look at these things, I will open it up to you first. What's important to God? What did you read this last week that, that spoke to you, that struck to you? What do you have questions about? 
Debbie. Yeah, and and I'm trying to remember, and I can't look at it while I'm thinking about this. When when Akish is saying, you know, um, as surely as the Lord lives, is is that in our English? Is that Lord capital L capital O capital R capital D? Okay, so it is. Okay, because that would mean that he was actually using the name of God, Yahweh. Uh, there, so yeah, so but they knew who who the who David worshipped, and they would use that name, but yet they still had uh, Damon as their god. So yeah, good thing. What else? What stood out to you? Yeah, and. It was with other groups. It's pointed out in there the, the groups that he raided against uh, were the Canaanites that were still in villages and in some walled cities there, but they weren't Philistines, so he wasn't raiding against Philistines, but they also weren't Israelites, but they were Canaanite villages and cities within the borders of Israel. And If, if they wanted to, yeah, that's where they, where they raid. These people were raiding back and forth among each other all the time. Uh, and so one of the reasons that was, was mentioned in scriptures, I recall, is that David killed everybody in those towns when they raided because they were Canaanites. That was within the, the purview. But also so that word did not get back to Achish that it wasn't actually Israelites that he was attacking. So now Achish, and when he tell him, Achish would say, where'd you go? And he goes, oh, I went up into Judea. You know, and it's like, okay, well, then the, uh, the Israelites are going to be hating David. Okay. And no, actually, he wasn't raiding Israelites. It was just within their territory. Yeah, interesting, interesting interplay there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Right, and so that's the reason they weren't to intermarry with them because they were not, uh, as as he said, whenever I'm sending sending the Israelites into Egypt for captivity for 430 years because the sin of the Amorites, the sin of this land is not yet full, but it's getting there. John? Okay. Yeah. There's there's some very interesting things along that line. I mean, things that were happening if you look at it from David's perspective in that he's learn I mean, he's a shepherd, okay? He's I don't know, 15, 20 years old. I how old when this is anointing happens. Um but he's not ready to lead a nation. So he's he's got some growing up to do. <laughs> Good plug, Zach. <laughs> Yeah, there's, it says those who were unhappy, uh, discontent, are coming to him. And it's, you know, they're, they're, people are not happy with Saul's, the way Saul is leading. And I think it was like 600 men that he took to Gath uh, in that group. And, you know, one of the thoughts that occurred to me is and especially I, I'm assuming there's around 600 men and their families that are with him running away from Saul in all these wilderness places. Now think about that for a minute. How much food does it take to feed 600 men and their families every day? And you're in the wilderness and you're on the move. How do you manage that kind of group of people? And then I got to thinking, you know, you read that part where, okay, now then, 
other people are starting to, to come to him, men of Manasseh, uh, men of Benjamin, you know, strong warriors. And you're going, yay, we've got more men. We're getting stronger. This is good. How are we going to feed them? Yeah. <laughs> Miraculously. That's where those come in. That's where a lot of that came from. Those raiding parties. Yeah. <laughs> Hunting. Yeah. So if you don't know, let me let me ask you to think about that point where he's running around in the wilderness and but he's not taking he they may be hunting wild game. But he and his men do not take any of the sheep from the, the shepherds. Uh, mostly, um, what was his name? Dabal? Na- Nabal? Fool? How would you like to go through life with a name of fool? <laughs> but <laughs> from, from Nob. <laughs> uh, and so David hears that um, that he's having shearing the sheep, which is a time of great festival and income, and this guy is really wealthy. So David sends some men saying, "Hey, you know what? We we kept thieves away from your from your shepherds. You know, how about sharing some of your bounty with us?" And he rebukes the men, speaks ugly and mean to them, and sends them away empty. How does David respond? You remember that? I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him and his kids, and I'm going to wipe them out, and I'm going to get the food for my men. His wife is Abigail. The, the servants come to her and say, we think the boss did a really bad thing. <laughs> David and his men really did take care of us, And he sent them away empty-handed, and that's not right. And she says, quickly, get a bunch of supplies and a bunch of stuff, and you send them to him, and I'll be coming along right behind you. But you get that on the way to him right now. Uh, Which they do, and she does, and when he catches up to her, let me look at my notes here a second. First Samuel 25. Um, what is Abigail's wisdom and words to David when she gets there? It was, you know, my husband, Nabal, really is a fool. I mean, just like his name says. And, and he's wrong. And, you know, please, her words are, Yahweh has restrained you from saving by your own hand. Think about that for a minute. What you were going to say about, Yahweh has restrained you from saving by your own hand. And the word she says, uh, another way she puts it is, for my Lord working salvation himself. And in David's response to her that you are right, you and God have saved me from working salvation with my own hand. And I think that applies to what John was talking about this whole time. God, Saul is, is within David's hand at least twice or more. You know, in the cave, David goes into camp and could easily kill him, but that would be saving by my own hand. And he doesn't do that. He won't do that. Now, when somebody attacks one of the cities, he inquires the Lord, shall I go up? God says, yes, he will save other people, but he's not saving himself by his own hand.
I look at that as one of the principles of leadership is that you don't use your position of leadership to enhance your own position or your own wealth or your own power. You help other people. You do for other people. But you don't save yourself, even when attacked or maligned. But if you stop and pause and give yourself that moment between your stimulus and response, you can make a much better decision based on what God has in mind for you. Yeah. Mm. That I remember this from psychology class. Not a lot, but I remember this, that animals are stimulus response, humans are stimulus thought response, if we stop to think. Promise keeping seems to be important. Mm -hmm. God and, and doesn't give God the honor he's supposed to have. He, uh, God removes that, but he gives the promise to David as well in anointing David. And so the thing that is going to make David king is that anointing <clears throat> promise from God. It's the same promise that Saul has. So it's if, if David kills Saul, he's disregarding the promise between Saul and God. And that's all he has to stand on, too. Mm -hmm. So keeping... Uh, not not killing Saul directly, not taking him into his hand, is also um, not justifying, but um, regarding the promise at, that is making his position. Yeah. yeah. Saul is, and as part of what I would think of is, is David is saying, God put Saul in this position and Saul's life is in his in God's hands and he will take him away when he is ready. And it's that part waiting, but boy, life is hard until God gets ready. After he cut Saul's robe. Like all he did, he, he cut a corner off of the guy's robe. And I should have done that. Yeah, like he, he's, he's equating the robe to the, the person, mm -hmm. which in ways, I mean, there, there are some, some views of that's included. So in ways, he did harm Saul by cutting his robe. And he goes out and at a distance at least, but he still is within shouting distance of Saul uh, and, and proclaims that he's sorry for doing this. No. He was wrong, even at just cutting off a, a tidbit to prove that he could have and didn't do more. My hand is not against you. Yeah. Why, why are you chasing me? Why are you trying to kill me? I didn't kill you. That wasn't why he went out. He left the cave because his conscience got on him for having cut the cloth in the first place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let me ask you let me ask you a question. Uh, when, in the early part of our readings, when Saul was uh, fleeing from David and he goes by the city of Nob, uh, which is where Ahimelech was. Ahimelech is uh, the high priest. He's actually the great-grandson of Eli the high priest, you read about in the first of first part of First Samuel. 
Okay? Remember the story? He gets there uh, and he says, what, what does he tell Ahimelech? Do you remember that? He says something about, I'm on an urgent mission for the king. Pardon? Yes. Yeah, he says, do, do you have any provisions here? Do you have anything to eat? We're, we're on an urgent mission. He has left. He has fled, and apparently the men with him, uh, without any food or provisions or weapons or anything. At least not a lot of it. And his reply is, well, the only thing I've got is the bread of the presence, the show bread, out of the tabernacle. Ahimelech asked him, you know, this is holy bread. Uh, are you and your men holy? David's reply is, uh, even on an ordinary mission, we are holy. We haven't, you know, we're holy. How much more on this mission? And so Ahimelech gives him the bread, which he and his men eat. And he says, do you have any weapons? And the only weapons he has is the sword for, that David took from Goliath. Uh, Goliath's sword, and he goes, that's a great sword. Yeah, I'll take that one. And they flee. It's also mentioned that there is another character there uh, who is Doeg the Edomite, not an Israelite, but an Edomite, uh, who is Saul's chief herdsman. Okay? That's the story. Set that aside. What happens in the next chapter? Saul finds out about it. Saul is on one of his rants and says, my son Jonathan supports David. All you people are supporting David. You're all against me. Everybody hates me. Everybody's against me. You're all worthless. And Doeg goes, um, I, I got some news for you. I saw David, Ahimelech, and the priest help David out. They what? So he summons the high priest and all the priests from this city of Nob and accuses them of helping David. Ahimelech's response is, well, yeah, he's your right-hand man. He's the commander of your guard. He does everything for you. What? This isn't the first time he's inquired of the Lord, uh, you know, on, on a mission from you. What, what's the problem here? I knew nothing about this. I, I know nothing about it. And Saul's response is, you and all your household are going to die. And he tells his men, kill them. And how does his men respond? What? <laughs> These are priests of Yahweh, of the God Most High? I'm not doing that. I am not doing that. And Doeg goes, I will. Pardon? Yeah, he's a Edomite. He kills 85 priests that day then takes men, I don't know what group of men, back to the city of Nob and kills all the women, all the children, and all the livestock. The only one that escapes is Abiathar, Abiathar however you say that, uh, Ahimelech's, one of Ahimelech's sons. He flees to David. David says, the guy that's seeking your life is also seeking mine. Okay? Um, by the way, the prophecy about Eli that God gave to Eli was that you will never have an old man in your family line and all your descendants will die by the sword. 
Interesting. Set that aside. Don't have time to go down that road. Um, now I want you to take a look at Psalm 34. I don't know when David wrote Psalm 34, but it's attributed to when to where he went right after this, which is when he feigned madness before the king of Gath. But he's thinking about and what happened to the high priest, Ahimelech, and his family. And he flew and he and he fled to, to Gath. There's some phrases in Psalm 34. But I want to ask you this question. When he was at Nob and talking to Ahimelech, let me put it this way. Did he tell the truth? Not the whole truth. He didn't tell the truth. He was not on a mission for the king. He did not tell the truth. <laughs> for himself. Do we say something about saving by your own hand? Uh, and I think that's one of the lessons he learned because in Psalm 34, as he thought about this, I think at a time later, there's the phrase, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. That also has the phrase in it, Psalm 34, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. I keep wondering if David was thinking about, would the high priest have been killed if I had not lied? If I had told the truth? He may have still helped him, but it, was, it would have been his decision. The other thing I wanted to go back and talk about this is this is also the passage that Jesus quotes in the New Testament. When he and the disciples were walking by and it was the Sabbath and they were hungry and they grabbed some grain and they threshed it in their hands. And, and a, have you ever done that as a kid? Walking by a wheat field? Some of you have. I, I did. There was a wheat field on the way home, walking home from school. And when the wheat was ripe, you reach over and you grab a head and you rub it between your hands and blow off the chaff and you've got some, some wheat there. That's what they were doing. And they said, ah, your disciples are sinning. They're, they're, they're gathering on the Sabbath. And it's recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In Matthew, the words are, and if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. In Mark, it says the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, so the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And of course, Luke is just the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. I don't know about you, but I have always done some wrestling with that. Because how is it that David did something that was not lawful and yet was okay? How do I know that? One of the things that I would tell you is, why is it okay for the priest to eat the showbread, the holy bread? Pardon? He did. And why did he say they could? entirety to be his portion to serve him at the altar and to 
feed them, he set up all of these sacrifices that meant people had to bring food, basically, to the altar. Some of it was delivered to the Lord and burned or on the altar, but some of it was kept for the priests and their families. Yeah. God took the Levites to be his portion, his people, and when he did that, he told them, you are holy. You are dedicated to me. You belong to me. You are holy. And when you take the showbread out of the presence, it is to be eaten by the priest because the bread is holy and you are holy. What was Ahimelech's question to David and his men before he gave him the bread? Are you holy? With a woman at that time, right? That was one of the things, yes. But, yeah. Yes. Could it be that the killer tried to go off? Yeah, that's the other part of that. But how do you know? They were hung? Yeah. That's good. They did. Well, and it's that the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was not made for us we, we the sabbath was made for us we were not made for the sabbath that's a blessing for us don't let it be a curse there's some some really deep water you can get into here and and i just want you to be aware that there's some of this that's going on and Part of what I wanted to also let you know is when David dealt deceitfully with Ahimelech and Ahimelech and his family and, and friends, uh, they suffered because of that. One of the other principles of leadership that I think I find here and in other places is that when leaders make good and righteous decisions, well, let me put it another way. Whatever decisions leaders make, people reap the consequences. If a leader makes poor decisions and behaves unrighteously, people suffer. David didn't particularly suffer from his deceit with Ahimelech, but the people did. And I think he suffered because of that and was reminded of it every time he looked at his high priest, Abiathar. But when, people, when the leaders make good decisions, the people reap the consequences, but they're good consequences. It's part of the weight of being a leader, knowing that your decisions may not may cause benefits or consequences to people, other people, whether or not they affect you. John, you started it. Amazingly reckless that God gives us children when we're so young and inexperienced. <laughs> and no manual. And no manual. But one of the things, one of the things that God seems to have a history of doing is delegating Obviously, the king is delegated an incredible amount of authority. God gives David the authority to do things, and therefore all the consequences that come out of it. Um, but that's not just an Old Testament story. I mean, I think, you know, what, what has God granted us as Christians with the gift of his spirit? How much has he delegated to us? You know, what are, what are the expectations in that God has given his kingdom in many ways, you know, through the church to us um, to participate in this great thing that's going on. So we see these events happen in David's life and we go, oh, well, that's a consequence of David doing the right thing and oh, that's a consequence of David doing the wrong thing. I believe those things still exist today, that God still delegates and that things still go well or go poorly. 
Mm -hmm. and that we are part of we are part of that living out. No, we we definitely are part of that that living out, and those principles are still in effect. Of of principles of leadership, or whatever you want to call them, or consequences, or that, that it's all there. Um, sword, right? So did David know who this, who he was, the, this guy was the ascendant of, and know, did he know that those people were doomed to die by the sword already? I mean, even if David had not deceived him, these people apparently were going to die because of this the prophecy said so, correct? Yeah. Did he know about it? Probably. Did he equate it with the guy that he had known for all of his life? Probably not. I don't know. It, there's nothing in Scripture that connects those two. But I just realized as I was studying this week that that, that prophecy was made about Eli and his descendants and that's exactly what happened generations later. This is one story. There were several generations. What happened to the others? I don't know. There's no stories about it. Um, we're running out of time. We're a little bit over. Let me encourage you to uh, pick up and read, if you haven't been reading, to just start where we are. Next week, uh, the storyline will be uh, 2 Samuel uh, 5 through the uh, first part of chapter 17. Um, David becomes the king of all 12 tribes, so the civil war ends. The ark is brought into Jerusalem. Uh, Yahweh, the Lord, makes a covenant with David. David has a lot of victories and defeats. I threw a couple of them up there. Um, and then there's some verses in First Chronicles and that relate back to the, the, uh, the storyline of Second Samuel and also a couple of Psalms about what's going on this time. Uh, look forward to being with you next week. Glad you're here. And uh, if you have children, would you go rescue the teachers? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>